Hello and welcome to another Big Data London webinar. Today we're talking about Data Mesh. So um, I'm Andy Steed, Content Director at Big Data London, and I'm joined today by another Andy, Andy Mott from Starburst. Hi Andy, how you doing? Hi Andy, all good. Good, good. Um, so these sessions are designed to be interactive. Obviously Data Mesh is a very hot topic at the moment, so I'm sure you've got lots and lots of questions. You can ask those questions in the box beneath the screen there. Um, and we'll uh, ask them in the dedicated time for Q&A after the presentation. Um, in terms of uh, any interruptions in the service, there shouldn't be, but just in case, just hit refresh in your browser and you'll, you'll jump straight back in there. Um, however, without uh, further ado, we may as well go over to the meat of the, meat of the presentation. I'll, I'll pass you over to our feature presenter today, uh, Andy. Over to you, Andy. Thank you, Andy. <laughs> so... Um, so yeah, the purpose of today's presentation is to uh, basically give you guys a, a 101 on data mesh, uh, what it is, uh, why you need it, uh, and uh, so this isn't. We're not going to go into sort of deep dives in in many of the, the different aspects, but just uh, a very high level. Uh, and then you know, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, my QR code for LinkedIn is, is on the screen. Uh, if you kind of want further discussion, debate, uh, if you want to dive into more detail at a, you know, at a, later, um, a later point in time. So, um, data mesh. Data mesh is a term that uh, was really founded around about 2019 by a lady called Jamek Degani. Uh, she wrote a blog post that was posted on the Martin Fowler uh, website. Uh, and in, in, one word, in one sentence, she defines data mesh as this uh, decentralized socio-technical approach. Now, uh, I think this is really important to, to just focus on, on some of those words for a moment. Socio-technical is kind of the important aspect of this sentence. Uh, we're not just talking, when we talk about data mesh, we're not just talking about technology. We're also talking about uh, business process. We're talking about culture. Uh, we're talking about things like incentivization. Uh, we're talking about ownership, um, and specifically um, ownership of data. Uh, now, uh, you know, I, I quite like this this definition. Um, I tend to use one that I think is um, a little bit more concrete, um, where I like to think about data mesh being a, a decentralization of the ownership and the transformation and the serving of data. And we'll dig into kind of what that means uh, over the over the next few slides. So, if we uh, sort of outline the problem uh, domain, if you will, the the, the, the context, uh, the thing that data mesh is attempting to to solve, is if we look at the architecture, the data architectures that we see uh, today in in organisations. We, we see this sort of split between what we call what we can call the operational data plane and the analytical data plane. Um, and if we ex expand out what we mean by that, if we think about the operational data plane being uh, the collection of uh, technologies and processes that we have that uh, allow us to run our business. So we could think about uh, uh, data stores, uh, da databases that uh, store state, for example, it may be the uh, you know our bank balance. Um, it may be data about uh, how much uh, of our internet usage we've used on our mobile phone this month. Um, it may be data around you know uh, customers and, and you know the CRM systems. Um, this is really the data that is used on a, a very frequent everyday basis to manage and understand kind of what is happening at a, at, in the business at a point in time. Um, and then we have on the other side, we have this, this concept of the analytical data plane. Uh, and I'm sure everyone's familiar with the concept of things like data warehouses and, and data lakes and uh, data marts and perhaps OLAP cubes and, and all of these uh, sort of artifacts that, we, that we've got uh, in the data space that allow us to essentially run analytical workloads. This is really where they all fit, right? So um, the purpose of all of this investment into all of these different technologies is really to enable us to execute some form of analytics, which are therefore allows us to make better decisions uh, and uh, ultimately allows us to optimize uh, business, optimize the way we operate our business. So in this side of things, what we're really focusing on 
is uh, looking at, for example, historical data, uh, running things like uh, descriptive diagnostic, uh, predictive prescriptive type analytics, all of those uh, activities that you know are very important and we see organizations uh, focusing on and, and really kind of investing in. Um, now, in the middle, we have this uh, this thing that I've termed DTL, but, but also we could call it a, a data pipeline. Um, essentially, it's the transform of data, uh, sorry, the, well, the extraction and the transformation and then the loading of data from the operational plane into the uh, analytical plane. Um, and if we think about that for a moment, uh, that is uh, a very different concern that the, the, the folks that are responsible for, for the ETL process are really interested in uh, kind of the operational plane as a as a, a source of data, and then the analytical plane as a as a target of data. Uh, the, the the people that run these systems, uh, and what I mean by systems in this case, I'm talking about the operational plane, the analytical plane, and then the ETL uh, component in the, in the middle, are typically very different uh, sets of uh, people, and they have very different concerns. So the guys that are running the operational data plane are typically uh, focused on the technology and the data um, that is there to support the running of the business. Their, their sort of motivation, if you will, is to make sure the business keeps running, keeps uh, you know, keeping the lights on, uh, making sure people can do the things they want to do, making sure customers can you know, see their balance, making sure customers can use their services. Uh, the folks on the right-hand side are really focused on, as I said, this kind of um, optimizing and, and making better decisions and, you know, be it things for marketing, maybe uh, focusing on different uh, customers, maybe it's churn, maybe it's risk, maybe it's fraud. Um, they're really kind of focused on that aspect. And these are these are actually very different aspects when, when we sort of really think about it. Um, and then, as I say, we have these, these guys in the middle that are kind of squeezed to some degree uh, because they have to know an awful lot about both sides. So if we think about the, uh, the that, that ETL process, if I'm to perform that function, uh, then I need to really understand the technologies and data uh, models in the operational data plane. I need to understand the uh, the business requirements and the technology and the data models on the analytical plane, uh, and the and the and the kind of technology underneath that. And I also need to understand the uh, the data transformations. And the data transformation technologies, including uh, catalogs and, and governance uh, technologies, um, in the piece in the in the middle. And what we're really doing is we're requiring that sort of central team that sits between those two planes. We're requiring them to know an awful lot. Uh, we're requiring them to be experts in the in the business in terms of uh, how people consume data, and business uh, sorry, and experts in the operational data plane in terms of how we are kind of capturing data, as well as all those other aspects I, I just mentioned. Um, and actually, what we see is is that they become a bottleneck. So if we, for example, have uh, a, a you know a new analytic initiative in the analytical data plane, we decide that actually uh, we would like to. Uh, respond to a changing market. Our competitor releases a new product or service. Uh, we need to respond to changing market regulation, or you know we have some sort of internal initiative to do something different or better. The likelihood is we'll need additional data to that we have. So we would make a request to the to essentially the folks in the ETL team to say, can we get access to this new better data? Um, and what really happens is that a ticket gets raised into a, some sort of queuing system. And at some point in the future, someone responds to that and they will uh, actually action this, this ticket. And now we have that new data available in the analytic data plane and we can start making decisions on it. In all likelihood, it won't be quite what we asked for or it might be what we asked for, but actually the problem has changed or the question has changed. And we, we kind of get into this cycle of, uh, us asking for something, getting something that's not necessarily what we wanted and asking something, et cetera. Um, and that obviously slows down our ability to ultimately make that better decision. Um, equally, if we think about the operational data plane, it may be very easy for us to, or for the, the, the folks in the operational data plane to make available uh, new data, uh, you know, maybe a new data feed. So if we were thinking about, let's say a website and we were looking at customer journey, 
it may be just a, a flick of a switch to enable us to track the movement of a mouse through a website, for example. Um, and then we would capture you know, some very rich data around how people are using the website. That could then be flowed through an ETL process and made available in the analytical data plane. And that may make us uh, or enable us to make better decisions. But if the guys on the operational data plane are not incentivized, they're not motivated to do this, and they don't actually know that there's a real demand for this data, then why would they capture that data? And so what we're kind of saying here is um, we have this scenario that you know, we've developed over the last sort of uh, you know, 20, 30, 40 years where um, really we're not uh, as agile as we could be when it comes to responding to new requests from the analytical data plane. Uh, and from the operational side, we're not necessarily as uh, proactive or motivated or incentivized to make data available from the operational data plane. And then we have, as I say, the folks in the middle who are sort of trying to hold all this uh, complexity together. Um, and really, uh, if we uh, if we think about this, this you know this is not an ideal uh, an ideal situation. So I often get asked where things like data warehouses and data lakes and things fit into the, into this uh, picture when I when I present it, um, and I would suggest that both uh, enterprise data warehouses or data warehouses and data lakes fit in that analytical data plane, um, and uh, there's a, a discussion as to whether they they sort of fit into a data mesh or they don't. Um, that that's perhaps a, a longer discussion for another day. Um, but what I would say when we consider a data warehouse, we are modeling data. Uh, in a kind of uh, based on consensus that we define up front. And so when we think about uh, making modifications later on, that can be quite hard. Um, and so that, that kind of feeds into that process of if we've got a new question, how do we get that data through? And, and it may be an impediment to getting data in a shape that's available for end users to consume. Um, if we consider a data lake for a moment, again, data lake fits in the analytical data plane. Um, with a data lake, we tend to just pull data from the operational system as is into the analytical data plane. And you know, and that, that's fine. That takes off some of the load in that middle team. But now what we're essentially doing is making it much harder for the end users to consume that data because now we're asking them to interpret what that data means. Uh, and that's not necessarily ideal either. Um, so so uh, to some degree, the data warehouse and data lake, that although they both sit in this, potentially sit in this analytical data lake, uh, plane, um, they are at sort of different ends of the spectrum uh, and uh, provide different benefits and costs to the, the users and, and the uh, overall picture. So um, if we kind of think about that sort of one level up and think about uh, you know, this, this separation of concerns between the operational and the analytic uh, data planes and, and the uh, ETL people in the middle, we essentially have uh, some, some kind of high level uh, issues. We have this inability to scale to data sources. So as we add new operational, uh, sorry, new data sources to the operational data plane, um, the time that it takes for that data to get through the ETL process and into the uh, analytical data plane and therefore support optimizing the business, that can be significant. Um, you know, that could be, can be weeks, months even. Um, and ideally, we, we want to have that uh, in, a, in the shortest possible time scale. We have this inability to, to kind of scale to new users. So um, we're not just talking about adding uh, you know, more users. We're adding new users, new initiatives, um, you know, bootstrap new uh, kind of analytic applications. That potentially will take us uh, a, a lot more time because with these new use cases, we may need different and new data from the operational systems. And we've got to go through that process of uh, specifying, specifying what we want uh, and then building that ETL process to, to bring that data through. Um, ultimately, uh, the, we're, we're not going to be able to materialize the, the value uh, based on the investment that we've made in data and, and technology uh, in the way that we would probably like. So, Really, if we think about what Data Mesh is trying to provide here, um, it's trying to uh, enable organizations to respond uh, in the optimal way. Um, and what I would suggest is really this is about uh, agility. So uh, by adopting a Data Mesh approach, and we'll get into kind of why this is later on, uh, we are enabling organizations to 
been much more agile in their ability to make new and better decisions. Um, and we're enabling that to happen over a sustained period of time. So uh, things change in, in, in the world all the time. That, uh, that may be new competitors coming to a market, that may be regulatory changes, that may be M&A activity from a, an organizational perspective. Uh, you know, it may be that we adopt new technologies. Uh, it may be that we use data in a different way. Uh, and so while all that change is going on, data mesh is really uh, suggesting that, that we cope with that change. And while that change is all happening, we are still able to respond to the requirements of the business uh, in an agile way. So some of the, the sort of past blockers that have prevented us from really being able to, to sustain this agility Things like this uh, centralized uh, bottleneck. So um, if we think about uh, that, that central uh, sort of ETL team, and, and it typically does tend to be centralized. It typically tends to be like a data warehouse team or a data pipeline team or you know, a data lake team that we go to and ask for, uh, yeah, for assistance. Um, and really, Data Mesh flips that on its head. And, and again, I'll come on to this momentarily, where we're starting to align what we call the business domain uh, with the technology and with the data. Uh, and so we're, we're breaking away from this kind of monolithic approach or this centralized approach into a very much a decentralized approach. Um, we have this uh, pipeline fragility, and, and especially when we think about um, data warehouses where we have an ETL process, where we're transforming data to a specific uh, model, if, if we need to uh, change that model, or if we need to change some of the underlying tech, or if we need to change the transformations, um, they will more than likely have downstream consequences on, on other ETL flows. Uh, and so we want to remove that fragility. We want to be able to modify the way we think about data uh, in such a way that we don't break everybody else. Uh, and then the last point on here is this uh, lack of talent. So uh, I see all the time on LinkedIn, uh, especially over the last uh, month or so, people advertising for data engineers. And it's clear that you know, data engineering is probably becoming the new data science, which was probably the, you know, the, the new analyst or, or, or whatnot some time ago. Um, and so one of the things that Data Mesh brings with it is this concept of a self-service infrastructure platform. And again, we'll talk about this momentarily, which is really helping to abstract us away from some of the, uh, the aspects of, that we require in terms of data engineering skills. Um, and this abstraction uh, away from that allows us to have a more sort of generalist uh, uh, people being able to contribute towards uh, some of the data engineering tasks and activities. So there are, uh, as defined by uh, Jamek, there are four uh, principles of, of data mesh. And I'm going to spend some time uh, going through each of those four in, over, the, uh, over the next period of time. Um, but just at a high level, we can think of domain ownership being the concept of uh, getting together a group of uh, people, essentially, who have the responsibility for um, uh, extracting and transforming and uh, serving data, uh, and really, but, but focused around a specific area. Um, and again, we'll come on to this. So, but this could be something like finance, or it could be like customer. Um, so we're, the idea is that the domain, this group of people, are responsible for, for, the, for data from end to end. Um, and this data that, they, uh, that they, they serve, they serve as a product. Uh, and when we think about data as a product, we're thinking about it in a different way from before. Uh, before, we, were, you know, we would have things like data marts, and if the data is in the mart, then that's great. But if it's not, then you, know, you have to go back and get the mark created and, and re-updated re and whatever. Here, we're really thinking about the domains producing these data products, which are uh, meeting the needs of the consumers and meeting the needs of other uh, data products that would like to consume our, our, um, our data. Um, and it's very product-centric thinking as opposed to uh, kind of here's a data mart, you guys go and use it as it is. Now, to build these data products, the domains need to have the ability to use some technology. And this really is where this self-service data infrastructure piece comes in. So the self-service data infrastructure, uh, and again, we'll go into this in more detail, is the platform that allows the domains to build these data, uh, data products. And then the last piece is this concept of federated computational governance. Now, 
uh, clearly, if we had a bunch of people in different domains who were going off building data products, using the self-service infrastructure, and they were all different and they couldn't be used together, then we'd have kind of a problem. You know, essentially we'd have anarchy. And the uh, Federated Computational Governance Pillar is really about defining standards and then enforcing those standards in an automated way so that when data products are published to the mesh, then they conform to these standards and can be used very easily together and, and interoperate and have security and, and all the things that we would expect. So um, if we think about uh, domains for a moment, um, I have this, this kind of very simple, uh, a simple view, if you will, of, uh, of helping people to understand really what a domain is. So um, what we've got on the, on the left-hand side is this ingest, process, and serve as different teams in an organization. So we may have this, and, or we may have a situation where these are all in one team, or we may have a situation where you know, they're split into, into more teams. But you can imagine you've got data coming in from that operational system. You've got some, uh, some folks that are responsible for ingesting that data, some other folks that are responsible for transforming it and processing it, and some other folks that might be responsible for serving it. And then you've got your downstream consumers. With the concept of domains, we're really kind of spinning that, spinning that round, if you will, and we're saying, right, for uh, let's say for customer data, we're going to have one team, one domain that does the ingestion, the process, and the serving. Uh, for risk data, we're going to have one team that is responsible for the ingestion, the process, and the serving, uh, and they will be responsible for that, as I say, for that end-to-end -end, um, process. So as we get new data topics, let's say. Uh, we can just add a new domain. If we have more data coming into a specific domain, then we can increase the size of that domain in terms of skills if, if we need to. Um, we're starting to break away from this centralized paradigm where uh, in, in the previous case, if we had more data coming in, we'd have to potentially get more people in the ingestion team. Um, those people would have to become experts in this new data feed. Then we'd have to have experts uh, in that new data feed in the process team. And then we'd have, have experts in that serving team. And all the while, the ingestion, the process, and serving team are also supporting all the other data feeds. When we think about this picture on the right-hand side, this uh, where we have kind of this more domain, this more horizontal view of the world, uh, it's very easy for us to, um, let's say, increase the uh, the skills and the the uh, ability of the folks in the domains to uh, to respond to changing data requirements. Um, I often get asked about the uh, different how you how you define domains. Um, broadly, there are two uh, two different approaches. Um, they're not exclusive, um, but but broadly, we have the concept of a domain, which is aligned with uh, with origin of the origin of the data, uh, and dom domains aligned with consumption. Uh, I would actually say the definition on the left hand side. Probably, I need to work on that a little bit. Um, what I tend to mean by that is uh, sort of a data warehouse subject or a topic. So you might have domains that are aligned with, let's say, customer data, let's say, product data. Uh, and so those domains that you might have a group of people who are responsible for customer data, all the customer data from all the different sources, bringing that all together, transforming it, and making that available as a, you know, let's say, a customer table or a, a, a list of high-value customers or, or whatever those data products may be. Um, equally, the other approach is aligned with consumption, where we might say, well, actually, we have a finance team and we have a marketing team. Uh, and so we want our domains to be aligned with marketing. And so all the data that's pertinent to marketing will be owned by marketing and they will produce uh, data products that, that are based on all that sort of data. Um, there are pros and cons to each approach. Uh, you can think that um, most organizations have functional departments, and so it might be easier to just align domains with functional departments like risk, finance, marketing, logistics, et cetera. Um, and, and that's certainly a direction that we've seen uh, some organizations uh, move along. Uh, equally, we've also seen some organizations who have those functional departments think about domains as more like a virtual team that kind of go across um, so they might have customer a customer domain, uh, which has representatives from, let's say, finance and from marketing, as an example. Um, so there's, there's quite a lot of uh, things that you can think about in terms of the shape and the approach that you take to your domain structure. Um, which again, if you, uh, you know, if we want to have a discussion after this, then uh, more than happy to. Um, if we think about this, just you know, so from a, a sort of a domain-driven design approach. 
Uh, a domain is really this kind of context, this bounded context. So essentially, we're drawing a line around uh, this this domain, and we're saying that it's a combination of uh, the the people and the systems and the and the data products. Uh, I very much tend to think about it as team, uh, a group of people that are responsible for data, which is has some form of interdependency. Um, and they're going to be responsible for that data from the operational system uh, through to the analytical uh, output. And so if we think about uh, just a, a brief example, and I, I want to spend a, a moment on this slide, uh, we can think about a, an e-commerce site here. So in this case, we've got these four domains and they've got some... Um, We've got some uh, operational inputs and we've got some analytical outputs uh, and we can see these kind of lines between them. So for example, we've got top selling products coming from merchants uh, and that is being consumed by the marketing domain uh, and the marketing team, you know, creates advertising analytics and, uh, you know, and search uh, keyword performance. And um, what's interesting here though, is these linkages of uh, essentially data products that are exposed by the domains and then consumed by other domains is actually where the term mesh comes from. Uh, I see lots of people talking about mesh as if it's to do with you know, networks or it's to do with, uh, you know, I've got a data warehouse here and a one there and they're mesh nodes and these sorts of things. In reality, uh, the mesh, if you like, is actually the connections between the domains uh, and one level below that is the connection between the data products, because data products are inherently have a, an inherent one-to-one -one mapping to a, a domain. So uh, this is really where that that term mesh uh, comes from, and, and we're talking about the linkages between uh, data products across domains as being the kind of links in the mesh, and either domains or data products as being the nodes in the mesh. So um, conscious of time, so we'll get over to thinking about data and product thinking. So um, I, I sort of mentioned that these are slightly different from uh, things like marts um, earlier or things like tables. So if we think about a data product, a data product must uh, be uh, have these kind of three um, uh, capabilities. It must be feasible. So we must be able to create the data product. Um, it must be usable. People must be able to access the data in the data product and actually use it for some purpose. Uh, and it must provide some value. Um, and I think uh, that value piece is really important. So if we have a data product, uh, you know, we go to the effort of creating a data product and um, it's not being used, then there's an argument to say it's not valuable. And there's an argument to say that we've kind of wasted our time and perhaps we should remove that data product from our mesh. Um, equally, you can imagine that it might be great to have something that uh, is perceived to have great value as a data product, but if it's not actually feasible to use, uh, not, sorry, feasible to create, or if it's not actually sort of accessible by uh, consumers or, or other data products, then uh, equally it's kind of not of much use either. And so when we think about data products, we need to think about these three uh, criteria uh, amongst others, but I would, I would suggest that these are the key ones. Now, um, if we think about data products and what a data product really is, uh, I see quite a lot of different opinions, different viewpoints uh, in, in articles and material uh, kind of out there on the, uh, on the internet. And so I've drawn together these kind of five different uh, viewpoints of uh, what people suggest a data product is. So over on the left-hand side, we've essentially got a table. Um, and so there are some organizations that say, you know, we, we build data products, you know, a data product is a table. Um, I would suggest that that's uh, you know, that's not really in the spirit of data mesh. Um, I'd suggest that that's not really uh, you know, that's just kind of not a, a data mesh pattern. Um, you, I, I also see this concept of uh, um, a data mesh data sorry a data product being uh, a combination of metadata and a table. And I should actually say when I say table, I mean uh, view or materialized view or table, some some form of uh, data asset. Uh, I just use the term table as a as a shorthand. Um, so yes, yeah, if we think about the second one, we have table and metadata. Um, our metadata is interesting here because um, traditionally when we think about metadata, we think about technical metadata, column definitions, uh, derivations, descriptions, uh, you know, max min variables, all that good stuff. Um, but actually in the context of data mesh, we need to think about metadata as being sort of slightly broader. So things like access permissions, um, who can access the data in the data product, who can access the data in the table, 
um, that also forms part of this metadata. Um, we might also have uh, catalog information. So we may have you know, um, hashtags, or we may have uh, descriptions, we may have um, information that says, you know, this data product is quite useful for this sort of use case. Um, and, and equally, but we may have observability metrics as part of that metadata as well. So um, we may have things like um, this data product, uh, you know, has five star rating, um, or we may have like the Amazon review system associated with our data product that, where people can come in and they can say, you know, this data product is great for marketing, but actually it's missing these important columns for financial analysis or, or whatever it may be. So, but we're bringing together that the, the actual data and that metadata now, and that forms that, that kind of data product. Um, now, if we move to the middle one, the, uh, where we're bringing in access patterns, what we're really thinking about here is what are the, uh, the output ports of the product? What are the ways that I can access this data? Um, so uh, you may want to access this data using a SQL interface. You may want to access it as a stream. You may want to access it using an API. You may want to access it using um, some form of machine learning uh, um, program uh, directly against the data. And so again, when we think about a data product, we need to consider that the access pattern and how it's actually going to be consumed. Um, and then the next one is where we start introducing code. So uh, here, what we're saying is the data product consists of everything I've said so far, but also the uh, the code SQL or data transformation code that is uh, actually used to generate the data. So now we've got the code that's used to generate the data, along with the you know the the authorization rules and the um, the catalog information, uh, along with how we can actually access it. And, and now we're starting to form a data product around those things. And then the last one is where we introduce the concept of infrastructure. And really, this is infrastructure as code. So here we might say um, the data product uh, contains uh, information to, let's say, start a cluster to, of, a, of a particular size, to execute some code, to produce some data, uh, to update some metadata in a catalog, to apply some data security privileges uh, to the data itself, uh, and then close that cluster down. Uh, and so, and this this piece on the far right is actually um, the closest definition to the uh, you know to to kind of the original intention of a data product in the data mesh. Um, so very much, uh, I tend to think of a data product as being essentially a configuration file which contains all of that information um, to build that data product. And and if you think we can schedule this, that you could you should be able to schedule a data product. So we schedule this data product to run, and when it runs, it's going to refresh and update the, the data that's available as part of that data product, and also the metadata, you know, the, the, the catalog and the, um, the authorization rules, for example. So um, if we think about sort of data products and we kind of expand them out a little bit, I said it needs to be valuable and, and useful and addressable and that sort of thing. Um, so we've got some usability here, a usability uh, requirements. And you'll see different lists of these you know, on the internet. There's, uh, I think DATSYS is very popular, discoverable, addressable, uh, trustworthy, uh, secure, et cetera. Um, there's, a, there's, there's lots of lists. But, but fundamentally, you need to be able to find the data product as a consumer of data products. You need to be able to understand it. You need to be able to connect to the data. You need to interoperate that, be able to interoperate that data product with other data products. It needs to be secure. These are sort of, you know, uh, no matter which um, sort of set of usability criteria you you kind of come across, these are some of the things that uh, make it are important. If you can't find the data product and you can't use the data product, then you probably won't. And if you don't use the data product, then um, then basically should the data product exist because again, it's the value to it. Um, we've talked a little bit about the uh, the sort of what I call the output ports, or where you know the different approaches to access the data products. And here we can see SQL machine learning and, and sort of a pub sub approach. Um, so this is just a, a slightly different way of uh, kind of looking at that. And then if we think about where a data product fits within a, a kind of a logical architecture within a domain, we can see here we've got um, a domain where we've got the uh, operational system, the CRM system. That's got uh, essentially a port that's uh, with the data being consumed into the data product for uh, this time we've got the merchant's data product. Uh, this is going to run some transformational code and it's going to then push that out through an output data port 
kind of make that uh, that list of top selling products out to uh, to end users and consumers. So um, data platform. So really, the, the purpose of the self service infrastructure is to enable autonomy. So what we want is we want our domains to be able to build data products without having to phone someone up. Basically, I mean, that, that sounds very simple, but that's basically what we want. We want the domains to be able to uh, be experts in data, but not be experts in technology. Uh, and, and I think that is a really important uh, concept to grasp. For the longest time, when we think about uh, things like Oracle DBAs, uh, an Oracle DBA would be like an expert in Oracle, uh, and they would probably be the person who had modeled the data, uh, who was responsible for you know, applying indexes and um, making sure the data was in the appropriate format and model for, for the kinds of queries that were coming in. What we're really saying is, is that concept is, is sort of split into two. So we have some folks who are responsible for the platform uh, performing at the best it can perform, and we also, uh, and that those guys will sit in the infrastructure as a, a service as the venture infrastructure team. But then in the domains, we have the guys that are all the folks that are responsible for modeling the data and making sure the data is the in the right structure for its consumption. And so this separation between uh, domains and a um, uh, self-service platform um, and the separation between data and infrastructure is, is kind of really important. And I would go one step further and say, actually, what you really want is you want to hide infrastructure from the domains. Uh, the domains should not really care that the data lives in the cloud or on premise or in a different region or, or somewhere else. Really, they should care about what's the shape of the data? What data do I need to bring together? What does the transformation look like? What do I need to do to this data uh, to make it the uh, the uh, the most valuable and the most easy to consume to the uh, the, the folks that are going to consume this data. So um, if we sort of split that out a little bit, we can think of various different planes of access. So we may have like the the data infrastructure plane at the bottom there, which is really uh, can be considered to be maybe data stores or, or data engines, platform components, if you will. Um, then we've got one level up, which is basically this data product developer plane. And here we can think of, we may have um, user interfaces uh, that are more suited to perhaps a data engineer or someone who is going to actually uh, build and, and maintain and involve data products over time. And so, uh, again, we want to give them an abstraction. We don't necessarily want them, in fact, we don't want the data product developer plane, uh, developers to need to understand the infrastructure, um, but we may want to give them more access and more user ability, usability uh, to be able to build and maintain data products than, for example, the folks that are accessing um, the, the data mesh or the data products through the experience plane. Um, and this, you can think about these as people who use uh, BI tools who are just going to maybe point a, a BI tool at, uh, at, you know, at a data product or the table or, or view of that's part of a data product, and they're just going to consume the data. Um, and, and they have different requirements to the, the folks that are going to be uh, developing and uh, maintaining data products. So we can start thinking about that self-service infrastructure platform as um, uh, kind of different planes where we're hiding different levels of complexity to uh, to really enable the, uh, the the different personas to focus on what's important for them to do their jobs. So, uh, you know, data product developer uh, shouldn't be focused on infrastructure. Um, someone who is using a BI tool to access data maybe shouldn't be focused on uh, the mechanics of uh, building and publishing a data product. Uh, and so that's kind of where we're we're aiming with that uh, with these different planes. So if we think about this and bring some of this together a little bit, um, we can think that we've got this uh, data infrastructure uh, plane at the bottom here. We can think we've got this data product developer plane, uh, and then we can think over oh, on the left hand side we've got our data product developer who is essentially going to build uh, a data product. And you can see here we've got. Uh, 
uh, kind of imagery of data product code and specification. Uh, and this is coming back to this concept of a data product really being like a, a configuration file. So this configuration file is going to be deployed into that data product developer plane, and it's going to execute. Uh, and what we're going to get out the other side of that is this uh, data product that is going to be then made available. Uh, and the data product uh, will be exposing a port. And if we use SQL as an example, um, this is going to show us that we're deploying this data product. We're going to materialize a table or, or a view uh, and then uh, open up an ac a SQL access point to a BI tool to be able to access that data. So this is starting to bring uh, some of that, some of those different things together. So we've got, I have a slight uh, tangent here, which I, I thought I'd drop in um, if I could fit it in in, in terms of time, and I, I will have a go. Um, this is just a, an observation. So this is slightly outside the concept of, of data mesh, but I, I feel like there's a little bit of value that this might, uh, might bring, which is um, in my discussions with uh, various companies that are at different stages of their data mesh journey, um, I see quite an interesting uh, kind of um, set of movements, if you will. So um, what, we, what I've seen is there are some organizations who are thinking about uh, platform and data migrations uh, when they're thinking about data and data mesh. And so on the left-hand side, we, uh, there are some organizations out there that have basically a single central store for their, uh, for their data mesh. And they're... Now, they do tend to be uh, digital native organizations. Um, and what's interesting about those guys is they are starting to, as part of their mesh uh, adoption, the domains are starting to say, well, actually, I would like, I, I need new capabilities. Right? So I, uh, I may have all my data in, a, in an object store, but actually, I in the domains, the domains will may come and say, actually, I need streaming technology, or I need... Uh, more transaction-like technology. And so the, the, there's a sort of a general move towards, if you like, uh, from left to right. Uh, and then when I've uh, spoken to larger organizations, um, mostly uh, sort of banks who've got a quite large legacy estates, actually, who or, or financial services organizations, I should say, who have uh, a large number of different, a large portfolio of uh, platforms in their analytical data plane, those are tending to look at the adoption of data mesh as a, an opportunity to consolidate down. So they're kind of moving from right to left. So I am sort of seeing this general pattern of the uh, adoption of data mesh uh, having an impact on the technologies that have been deployed, um, both from organizations that have relatively simple uh, technology stacks and those with very complex technology stacks, and actually sort of both of them sort of converging on some sort of central point. Um, and it's just just an observation that uh, that I think is quite uh, kind of interesting. Um, the domains uh, drive the requirements for technical capabilities of the self-service infrastructure platform. So, um, and that's something that I, uh, it's just something that I necessarily, I hadn't necessarily thought of when I you know, started thinking about data mesh originally. Um, but it's it's just an interesting observation, I think. So um, computational governance, federated computational governance. So um, this is a, a, a wide subject. And um, very recently, uh, Jamek um, published her, I think it was chapter seven um, of her book, which is available on the Starburst website in pre-release. Um, and that went into quite some detail in, in this. And I think that's kind of the first a um, major piece of work in really uh, kind of defining at a, at a lower level of detail federated computational governance. Uh, in my opinion, this is the, the area which kind of needs most work um, and is kind of least well understood. Um, if we just break this term down a moment and we think about federated and computational and governance, um, I think we're all familiar that governance is basically a set of rules, policies, laws, if you will, that, that we have to abide by. Um, if we think about the term federated in this context, what we're really saying is federated is we're bringing together some people um, and actually we're bringing together representatives of the domains to make the rules. That's really what that piece means. And then the computational piece is really what we're doing is we are automatically or autonomously enforcing those rules. So when we talk about federated computational governance, essentially what we're saying is we're getting a bunch of people, representatives from the domains who are building data products together 
to agree to some standards, and then we're going to enforce them in a uh, in an automated fashion. Um, I see lots of other you know long-winded definitions of that, but, but that's that's how I would break that down. Um, and so when we think about uh, sort of this federated governance uh, approach, we can think that at the top here we've got this concept of decentralization. So domains are kind of sovereign in their own way. If I have data uh, defined in my domain that is never going to be uh, kind of used by other domains, then I as the domain uh, owner, if you will, or data product developer, I kind of own the definition of that. As soon as there's a variable, or, or um, I suppose variable is the best term, as soon as there's a variable that is going to be required to be used to perhaps join two data products together, then we're exposing that uh, externally. And um, we need to make sure that those variables are able to be interoperable. So, you know, we may have, let's say we've got a customer table, a very simple example. We may have uh, a customer name, which is only ever going to exist on the customer data, on the data products associated with customer. Um, but we might have a customer key. And we might want to join that customer data product with, um, let's say, a transaction data product, which also has a customer key. Um, and so this is where the domain has sovereignty over, let's say, customer name, but the data mesh has to come to, and, and therefore the representatives of the domains, have to come to some agreement about what customer key uh, is and how it gets represented and how it can be operated or uh, interoperable. Um, and then, and, and furthermore, when we actually publish our data product, we ideally, we have some checks in place that kind of say, oh, you've published customer key, but customer key in the data product you've published does not conform to the standards. So, uh, you know, at the minimum, we're going to, the, the system will notify the data product developer there's an issue, or perhaps even prevent them from actually publishing. Um, similarly, we might say that uh, to publish a data product to the data to the mesh, it needs to conform to a certain quality standard, or, or at least it needs to expose a quality standard. So we may not say every data product needs to have, needs to have you know, zero nulls. We might have to say we might say actually you need to report how many nulls you've got in every column as part of the publication process. Similarly, we may have rules that say you must uh, have uh, security rules. Uh, as part of the domain, uh, sorry, as part of the data product as we publish. So this is sort of some of the rules that we need to kind of think about when we think about um, uh, governance. Uh, and this is kind of a uh, another sort of picture of that same thing. One thing, so, so automation is important, and this this combina uh, this bringing together a group of folks to define these rules is is also important. Um, the, the other piece that I will just mention on governance, and then uh, I will pause and we can maybe get into a few questions, is uh, incentivization. And we haven't, I haven't really talked about it uh, through this presentation because there's, there's not really a, a good place to put it. Um, but when we're adopting a data mesh, we are really asking people uh, to adopt uh, new approaches and to work in a different way and to create data products that are useful for the entire organization and, and sort of uh, have responsibility and ownership of those data products. Um, and the question is, uh, you know, why would they do that? You know, this is potentially a significant organizational change. Our, centralized, our central data team is potentially going to get smaller. Um, we may have a sort of virtual team of, of uh, we would put the, the data engineers out into uh, in, into domains and, and they may be virtually there or they may have new roles or, or, or whatever. But there's, there's an organizational change and there's a cultural change that's required. And um, incentivization, I think, is a really important part of this whole process. Uh, and I kind of feel like it fits into governance. Um, and part of the reason I say that is because what, what I have seen, at least, is organizations who are adopting data mesh are using uh, some proxy for the value of a data product. So let's say they're using the number of times a data product is consumed. Uh, so if I've got one data product that's consumed 10 times and one that's consumed 1,000 times, maybe the second data product is more valuable. Uh, it might be that actually that first data product is consumed by you know, the, the, the CR, a CEO and, and you know, C-level people, uh, and therefore, actually, that, that's quite important for making strategic decisions. Uh, and so there is a balance there. 
but the usage of data products is uh, a, a rudimentary proxy for um, uh, for value, and, and I'm, I'm starting to see that. And some organisations are actually uh, going out there and adopting approaches where they are bonusing and commissioning uh, their data product teams uh, based on usage of data products. Um, and I mention this because I think incentivization. Um, and I'm not suggesting that everyone does that, that, that approach where they just give money for you know, usage. Uh, I think perhaps we need to be a bit, a bit more nuanced than that. But, but incentivization, I think, is going to be a key aspect, uh, certainly of consideration when adopting a data mesh to ensure that uh, we have people working in the right ways with the right behaviors to ensure that data mesh is, is kind of a success. Um, and, and this kind of comes all the way back to the, the slide at the beginning where I uh, referenced that uh, it's really a socio-technology, techno technical uh, or a, you know, an ownership, decentralizing the ownership of data. This is a really important aspect that we don't sort of, um, that we don't miss out, that really we need to make sure that people are as much a part of the data mesh adoption um, as, uh, you know, the technology piece itself. So I'm going to stop there. I think we've got about five minutes or so left. I'll just put a, there's a slide up that you can see. Unfortunately, for some reason, it's uh, um, the register today piece has gone across the uh, the dates, but I think that should say February the 9th and the 10th. Um, just if, if you're interested, Starburst are hosting a data mesh summit. It's a free event. You can join online. Um, and amongst others, uh, Jamek Degani will be presenting on data mesh. Uh, and there'll be some more, there'll be some sort of hands-on labs and things that, that uh, will also be quite fun to, to follow. So just a little bit of advertising at the end there. Perfect. Well, uh, thank, thanks very much, Andy. Um, there's a, yeah, did a great job getting through that in the time. There's obviously a, a lot to unpick uh, with Data Mesh. Um, and that's come through in the questions as well. There's a, there's a, a lot of questions. We'll get through as many as we can. Um, Anyone else? We'll, we'll we'll get back to you, um, you know after the uh, after the event. Uh, just a quick uh, just a quick one. If there's anything you want to go over on Matt's presentation again, um, this presentation's available almost immediately again over on demand uh, with a player. Uh, um, you know, play uh, forward, pause, and on a particular image or whatever. We have had a question about is it available on a sort of a free to share link. Um, in a couple of days, it will be on our YouTube channel. Normally, there's a link in the attachments to our YouTube channel. There isn't today, so you'll just have to Google uh, Big Data London YouTube. Uh, in those attachments, though, there's some interesting resources from Starburst. So uh, do do check them out, uh, a couple of guides and whatnot. Um, however, I'm going to try and um, get to these questions. Keep them coming, uh, for sure. Um, I'm going uh, I'm going to start with one, um, which seems like the most obvious place to start. Um, for a large complex organization with lots of organically developed systems and a weight of existing practice, what are the ideal steps, ideal first steps to transition to uh, this architecture? Or, or so, so basically, what, 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 what should you start doing first? You've made the decision, this is the way to go. What's, what's the best first steps? That, that's a great question. That's a great question. So, um, so I can... I can give you some thoughts on what I've seen from organizations that I think are successfully on their journey um, uh, towards a data mesh. Uh, and that is they have looked for a, uh, a, a sort of a, a scoped, a, a tightly narrow scoped data product uh, and uh, given a time box, typically three months, uh, and align some people around that data product uh, so essentially built a data domain, if you will. Um, uh, but it's very much a skeleton approach. So, you know, it's a lightweight. We're not, we're not, it's not a waterfall approach. It's very much, we have a data product. Our objective is to get a data product out the door, out the door in three months. We align people around that. Um, and every time those people in that domain need to uh, make a request of resource or technology or whatever it may be outside of that domain, we capture that information. Uh, you know, we capture information about how uh, all the challenges and all the things that, uh, you know, were difficult about getting that data product out the door within that three month period. Um, at the end of the three month period, we have a data product, which is great. Um, but more importantly, 
what we have is a bunch of organizational learning. So it may be that we needed to go to the central IT team 10 times for these 10 different things. So what we need to think about is how do we mitigate that? What is it that the central IT team is provided? How can we give that uh, those capabilities, uh, whether it's access to systems or whatever it is, to that domain uh, so that when we move to, let's say, data product two, which is in a separate space, a separate domain, they don't have to ask those same questions. Uh, and so I think it's um, that, that approach of almost organizational learning based on a, a three month time window. And the reason we said three months is a, uh, sounds like a long time, but um, people have got day jobs. So, um, you know, the reality is that uh, business has to keep running. Um, so that, that three months seems like a good, if it's any longer than three months, people lose interest, but three months is a good uh, amount of time to be able to get a first simple data product out the door to be able to figure out all the, or not all of them, but a lot of the organizational learnings, how we can actually work in a more autonomous way as a domain. Um, uh, along the way, uh, you will also pick up ideas on, well, what technology works, what doesn't, um, you know, things like catalogs, um, and also to some degree, uh, start leaning into some of the governance aspects. So, you know, um, what what is important for, for uh, for our organization in terms of governance? What are some of the rules that we have learned along the way? Um, uh, and so we can then start to apply those governance rules when we get to domain two, domain three, domain four. Uh, and clearly domain one will continue and maybe churn out a second data product and, and continue to learn. So I, I always think that uh, the first thing to do is to, it's almost like you want to suck it and see, which is a terrible phrase, but you're, you want to try uh, and you want to learn as much as you can with the first data product. So when you get to the second data product, uh, you're in the second domain, it's going to be a much more streamlined approach. Uh, there'll probably still be learnings. And then you take those learnings into the third one and the fourth one. And over time, you'll end up with uh, just a much better idea on how to motivate people, how to get a data product out the door, how to remove dependencies on that central team, what access is required, what, what requirements you have of a, a catalog. What are some of the basic rules that you need for your, your governance? Uh, and then you kind of iterate over time and, and build those out. So that would be my my suggestion as a, a kind of a starting approach. Perfect, perfect. I'll, I'm going to reword this question ever so okay. slightly because I think it's an interesting um, it, it's an interesting question for sure. Um, it's about technology within data mesh, and um, uh, it, uh, the contention is: um, do you do you need to update? You know, if you're doing things about culture, accountability, ownership, processes, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Do you need to do tech? Is technology modernization, if you like, always a part of this, or does it depend where you start? Or you know, c can you can you do this without ripping out your existing? So, so I think you can do it without ripping out. I think you may have to add. I think uh, when I talked about the self-service infrastructure platform, I talked about this um, uh, the separation between data and the infrastructure, which I think is a kind of a slightly different approach from what we've seen before. So no company has all of the data in one place. Like that, that, that's just the way it is, unfortunately. Um, you know, every company has you know, between five and, I don't know, 100% of their data, for example, on-prem, and the other, the other percentage may be in the cloud, uh, you know, simple example, or they may have you know, Teradata, Hadoop, Oracle on-prem, or whatever. Um, so I would contend that you make, you, you probably could keep a lot of those platforms. Um, there's no reason to, to kind of remove those. But from a domain perspective, you don't want the people in the domains to have to be experts in Oracle and experts in Teradata and experts in, in cloud or whatever. Um, you want to kind of hide that away. So I would not suggest that you kind of rip out everything you've got, but I would suggest that you may want to consider something that uh, abstracts away the requirement to have that sort of technical knowledge so that you can focus the domains can be focused on the data. Does that Perfect. make sense? Yeah. yeah, no, 100 percent 100 percent Um we've actually uh, we are running out of time. I'm gonna ask another question, well, another couple of questions that are tied them together, but I'm afraid I think we're gonna to have to get back to some of these other excellent questions um sort of af afterwards. Um we'll 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 send we'll send you some answers um to, to these afterwards. And thanks thanks everyone for sending so much in. Uh, we genuinely, uh, we, we we generally just can't get to everything. Um, so I was 
I was hoping to be able to ask like an obstacles question, you know, greatest obstacles, that sort of thing. But we've had a couple of questions which are kind of linked, which I'm going to ask both of them. Um, and I'm hoping the answer you'll be able to answer both of them at the same time. Um, so the first one is sort of um, uh, what what is the level of data literacy or knowledge uh, expected from an organisation uh, for for data mesh adoption? Is there any maturity assessment done, or is it sensible to do a data maturity assessment? Um, and the the other one, which is very similar, uh, in is a uh, you know one of the issues that this this uh, uh, questioner is uh, is facing is um the consumer part most of the business users who want the data aren't data literate um and rely on analysts to interpret it for them anyway um they, obviously they're going to length to try and uh, change this but um you know it, any advice on doing that so it's sort of a data yeah. literacy question yeah and any other obstacles I'm so i think i think that's uh so so i'll split that to two areas right so we've got the people that are building the domains uh, sorry the people that are building the data products in the domains so those folks are ideally the people who really understand that that aspect of the business and the data associated with it so um what we're there should really be no data literacy uh concerns with the people that are building the data products that um, because you know we're getting the people that understand the, the business and the data together in the domain. That, that's kind of one of the reasons why we do it. From a consumption point of view, I think uh, there's some fair questions there. Um, there's a few different approaches. I mean, obviously, we should always try and increase data literacy and, and education and all that sort of thing. But um, when we think about data products, there's nothing to say that a domain couldn't produce multiple data products for the same data. So it may be that I have my first data product is, you know, let's have just a list of customers. So a list of all the customers. That might be really interesting for a data science use case. I may have another data product, which is my top 10 customers by some variable. Um, I may have another data product, which is my, uh, let's say, uh, some other derivation of, um, of the, the customer uh, data. Um, now, the reason I say this is because what we can then do is we can then let the less literate or less, less data literate uh, uh, folks access a, maybe a different data product. So I'm not going to necessarily give someone, you know, a, a hundred column, million row uh, table if they're not data literate. What I may do is have a data product which contains, you know, an aggregated view or a summarized view or, you know, some shaped view which is more pertinent to their use case, which maybe has the six things they're interested in, uh, labeled and described in an appropriate way. And we use the catalog to, to help us with that. Um, uh, and with the, let's say the top 10, top 100, top 50, whatever it is, records that are certain, that are relevant to that, that kind of use case. So that, that would be one approach that we can take with data mesh, where we are producing data products, not necessarily on a, we, we, I don't think we should ever, this is my opinion, I don't think we should ever have data products that are directly associated with a report, let's say, but we may have a, a data product which is directly associated with a, a group of reports or a group of analysis. Uh, and therefore, we are lessening the requirement on the data literacy of the end users by giving them something which is directly usable. That makes sense? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And um, uh, I'm afraid, I'm afraid, everybody. I think that's it's come to uh, the point where we've uh, run a little over time and yeah. certainly run out of time. Um, I, I'd like to thank Andy again. Obviously, it's a, a big, big amount of uh, information to get through in an hour, and I think he did a fantastic job. So thank you very much. Um, thank you for everybody's questions. Um, and like I said, we're, we're looking forward to uh, seeing you at the next one. So uh, uh, thanks, Andy, again, and uh, we'll okay. see you soon. Thank, thank you. you. Cheers. Bye.